You know, if this is really already recording, y'all are going to laugh at me for this, aren't you? Oh, there we go. Just ding. So hopefully that means. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to class. We're doing section four today. So go ahead and get your notes out. Let's get started. So we're going to talk about the continuation of the Reformation and those ideas spread. So the Reformation of the church continued. And Protestant sects or groups developed all across Europe. Now, these sects were religious groups that had broken away from an established church. These are groups like the Lutherans, the Calvinists, both of which we talked about last class, and the Anabaptists. Now, the Anabaptists rejected the idea of infant baptism. They believed that you should make the choice yourself whether or not you wanted to be baptized. Um, and kind of going away from the notion that you got baptized as an infant, whether you liked it or not. Now, they also wanted to abolish private property and preach religious toleration and the separation of church and state. Now, these are some pretty radical things, even for the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. But some of these things have persisted to today. Now, let's talk about the English Reformation for a minute. It's a little bit different than the rest of it, kind of because it was its own thing. And by far, our most famous character we have to talk about is that of Henry VIII, the quote-unquote defender of the faith against the Protestant revolt until, well, long story short, again, like I said, royalty needs male heirs to continue. And Catherine of Aragon, his first wife, was unable to provide a male heir. She did provide a daughter, though, Mary Tudor. We'll talk about her another time. And he seeks an annulment or the cancellation of marriage from the Pope. Mind you, him and Catherine had been married for over 20 years at this point. The Pope said, no, no not going to happen. And fear of offending His Royal Highness Charles V of Germany, who was actually Catherine's nephew, because believe it or not, royalty is all related to each other. They're all some sort of distant cousin, brother, sister, aunt, whatever. They're all related. Now, Henry wanted to marry this lovely lady here, uh, Anne Boleyn, who, well, don't lose your heads, folks, because it was going to be a long process for them to get together. Now, he did this by taking control of the church, and he essentially broke off from the, the Catholic Church, establishing the Church of England, or the Anglican Church, and he appoints Thomas Cranmer as now, Cranmer, being under the king's thumb, granted the annulment. So, adios, Catherine. Here comes Anne Boleyn. Now, a little bit more about that before we get to some other stuff on Anne Boleyn. In 1534, the Act of Supremacy was passed by Parliament, making the king, or the monarch, the only supreme head of on earth of the Church of England. Now, Catholics that did not accept this were executed on the spot, and Thomas More was one of them. He refused to accept it, and he was later canonized or recognized as a saint by the Catholic Church for resisting. And here's kind of where we stand religiously uh, in terms of who's with who at this point of the Reformation. It's kind of a mess. So anything in yellow is Roman Catholic. This orange stuff is more so Lutheran. You have your Eastern Orthodox out here. Um, two main groups of Calvinists or Calvinist influence. And then, of course, you have the Anglicans. So 1533, Anne Boleyn marries the king. But unfortunately, their woes continue. No son was born. They did have a daughter, though. Elizabeth I. We'll talk more about her later. Now, he wants to divorce Anne to marry wife number three, Jane Seymour. Now, the only way he was going to do this was having Anne convicted of witchcraft and adultery, and she lost her head. Yikes. So, he marries four more times, including Jane Seymour, and actually has a son, Edward VI, who takes the throne at the age of nine and tries to make England a Protestant country after some stuff goes down, but he dies in his early teens. There was no male heir to carry out Henry's desire for a stable monarchy, and actually Jane Seymour died uh, shortly after giving birth to Edward VI. Now, these are all six of his wives. Now, the best way I can say you can remember this is 
divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. And also think about it, there's three Catherines, two Annes, and a Jane. Now to kind of just run, because we talked about the first three, let's talk about the latter three real quick. Um, Anne of Cleves, or Anna, because that's actually how her name was pronounced in German, was married to the king without having ever met. The king was like, ooh, she's pretty. I want to marry her, based off of her portrait, painted by Hans Holbein, one of the most famous painters in the world in terms of doing portraits. He actually painted all of these portraits, if I remember correctly. Now, Anne arrived in England. They met. Henry thought it got catfished, mainly because she was kind of ugly by his standards. Now, after six months, he had the marriage annulled because they didn't come relationship, but Anne didn't return to Germany. She went to live in a castle as the king's dear sister. She actually lived long enough to see Elizabeth I crowned Queen of England. Catherine Howard was actually the cousin of Anne Boleyn, and but she was eventually uh, accused of witchcraft and adultery as well, and she also lost her head. Now, Catherine Parr, my this lovely lady right here, was the last one to marry him, and she survived him. By a year and eight months, it is said she got remarried the day he died. Now, let's talk about Mary real quick. You may not know her as Mary Tudor. You may know her as a different name. Bloody Mary. Now, she was Edward's half-sister and the daughter of Henry and Catherine of Aragon. She tried to get England back into the Catholic faith, faith executed a lot of Protestants, hence the name Bloody Mary, and she dies in 1558, pretty much in obscurity. Her sister, on the other hand, well, I should say half-sister, is way more famous, Elizabeth I. Now, she was the daughter of Henry and Anne Boleyn. Now, there was a compromise, and she accepted the middle ground, and Protestants and Catholics lived peacefully during the Elizabethan age, and it reunified England. And England becomes a more tolerant Protestant nation in return. Now, that's really all we're going to focus on for the English Reformation. So let's jump to the Counter-Revolution, or the Catholic Reformation. Now, this was an attempt within the Catholic Church itself to fix some of the issues that they had seen. Now, they wanted to revive moral authority and corruption and increase the support of the Church itself by doing these things themselves. Now, at the Council of Trent in 1545, they made a number of decisions in terms of the directions of their reforms. They met on and off for about 20 years, and they reaffirmed traditional Catholic values in terms of what they were doing. But they also embraced the idea that salvation comes through faith and good works. They also said the Bible was not the only source of faith. They established schools, and there was actual pen penalties being established for corruption among clergy. So they were really starting to solve some of those problems. Now, groups to come out of this is the Jesuits, led by Ignatius of Loyola, or a soldier for God. And the Jesuits, or the Society of Jesus, were a new religious order put in place to defend and spread the Catholic faith, uh, ensure spiritual and moral discipline, and rigor rigorous religious training for people all across Europe. Now, you also have Teresa of Avila, who was a symbol of renewed intense faith. Uh, she established a new order of nuns. Uh, she reformed the Spanish convents specifically, and a lot of her writings were important, especially in of her writings in the way of perfection, or the way to live in the most godly-like manner. Now, some legacy stuff that we, of course, have to go to. The majority of Europe remained Catholic, uh, really uh, increased the amount of charity being done, and church abuses were, in general, reduced. So the Reformation had a major impact and really did improve the church. Now, was it as much as Luther had originally wanted? No. But it was definitely an improvement. Now, there was some widespread persecution coming out of the Reformation. It really heightened with the religious passion of the Reformation, and radical sects were being persecuted, namely Anabaptists, Jews, those suspected of witchcraft were among the major ones being persecuted at the time. So let's talk about some witch hunts. Now, these were centers of religious conflict, and witches were believed to be agents of the devil, typically women, and they were believers of Christianity and magic. Typically, they were also social outcasts, midwives, herbalists, 
Um, a lot of these issues carried over to the United States as well with the Salem witch trials. Jewish persecution, there was a lot of pressure to convert to Christianity, and they were uh, put into ghettos or separate quarters of the city. We'll see this again during World War II as well. And some were even ex uh, expelled or kicked out of certain countries because they refused to convert to Catholicism. All right, that is it for notes for today. So there's two things you're going to do. The first one is a extra credit opportunity. You're going to have the option to pick a song from Six the Musical, which is a musical focusing on the six wives of Henry VIII in the form of a pop concert. Now, you can pick any song from the show that you want as long as it's listed on the assignment. I've told you which six songs you can pick from. Now, this is good for up to 10 points of extra credit and is due next class. Your other assignment is just simply a reflection on the Reformation. We've done a reflection before. You know what those look like. I'll see you all next time. Bye, everyone.